So I'll just uh, give a quick start and we'll start the, uh, the presentation. We've got Austin Thornhill from Arizona, um, probably one of the best that I know here. I work with him at the Student Health Center, ultra qualified. Uh, we're excited to hear from him. We've got uh, Tyler Kilpack from Shelley, Idaho, and then uh, Dexter Truman from Pocatello. And uh, each have been ex uh, accepted to uh, some pretty neat programs. We're excited to hear from them, and they have a PowerPoint presentation, so let's give them a warm welcome. Um, so just kind of as a start, what we're going to do is we just have a quick presentation. Um, it's adapted from Brian Visser's presentation, where Brian Visser's one who he was a he's at Iowa, is it Iowa State? I don't want to do it. University of Iowa. Okay. And um, so we kind of, I got this presentation from him um, and adapted a little bit just for kind of our needs. What we're going to do is we're going to go quickly through um, just kind of all the steps of the application process, picking your schools, everything like that. Um, and then we're just going to hold questions until the very end. We shouldn't, we shouldn't take more than just a handful of minutes to get through this presentation. And then we'll just take questions on uh, whatever, whatever you guys need. Um, so yeah, just, so just to start out, um, really, really big and very important part of uh, applying for grad school is understanding your timeline. I think one thing, because we talked last night, I think one thing that we all, three of us, agreed on is, uh, yeah, we wish we would have had more time for certain things. We wish we would have prepared a little bit earlier. Um, wish we would have more time to prepare for either the GMAT or the GRE. Um, so just being very aware of what your deadlines are, um, understanding what you need before you, uh, before you absolutely need it. Uh, makes a big deal. So first part is picking your schools, um, preparing for whether you're going to take the GMAT or the GRE or both, um, filling out your application, and he, this is Brian's, some of his stuff in here as far as submitting by Thanksgiving, and it's kind of a caveat with that because some uh, programs, like for instance, uh, Tyler's program at UW, uh, the prior deadline is November 1st, right? So that's well before Thanksgiving. Um, and then, Decide a little bit more about your application, then getting on to your interview, the waiting process, and then basically paying for uh, paying for grad school. So, okay. so picking your schools is probably this is something that takes a lot of time um, because you'll find as you do your research about these different graduate school programs that they're not all the same and they're not all created equal. And the ultimate thing you want to do is you want to be able to find the best fit for you. And that's, you know, as you can, each of them can probably also tell you that that's kind of a spiritual experience as well as what you know about yourself. So if, you, if you're not sure what you want as far as graduate school, then it requires a lot of research. And that research is going to take you all over the place. Um, like I know for myself, you have to go online and find out information, calling different programs, asking them questions, you know, kind of making sure that they know that you're there. Those are all things that kind of go into finding the best fit. And that's, and that's what you're kind of looking for, whatever's the best fit for you. And here, um, Brian provided some of the, his little breakdown of whatever you're interested in as far as maybe a lot of people are like, do I go for an MHA, do I go for an MBA? Um, yes, the operation, system management, consulting, law. Whatever you're interested in, there's a program for you. <laughs> and it's all about figuring out which one you feel most comfortable at or would feel that plays to your strengths. Um, the other thing we have up here is the SOFIS or HAMKIS programs. It's really great because they're centralized systems that will help you apply to more than one program. You get, it helps you to fill out things once. You can upload your letters of recommendation, your personal statement, um, all of that stuff. And so, and then you can designate how many different schools will go there. And this, this ties back into doing your research, but not all schools that are on the SOFIS program are on the HAMCUS one, and not all of them on HAMCUS are on SOFIS. You'll find that some might be on both, but it really, it's kind of just a matter of, of where you want to go. Me, I ended up doing both because there were some schools that were on SOFIS that weren't on HAPCUS and vice versa. I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, and then of course you can always just apply through their regular program, like Dexter was saying. He didn't do either Sophus or Hamkiss, but I did all three. I, I used Sophus, I used Hamkiss, and I applied through their own program on their website. It's kind of like put it all in an envelope and mail it off kind of thing. Although a lot of things are really technical now. You can submit them online, which is nice. But again, that just goes back to doing your research. And, and the websites will give you a list of what schools participate in. The other thing to keep in mind, though, is that you not only pay like the application fee, so each school, let's say I go on SOFAS and I want to apply to Minnesota and Michigan and North Carolina and UAB. It, each of those schools is going to have their own application fee, like a processing fee, somewhere between $50 and $80. Everywhere is different. But then SOFAS itself also has a fee to send it to those schools. So that's also something to be aware of is that it also costs extra. So even though I did use SOFAS and I used Hamkiss, I didn't end up actually submitting anything. So I just did all the work to fill everything out and then I didn't, I didn't even send it in because well, things worked out for me. But So I didn't end up having to pay anything. But just keep that in mind as well. So that might limit, you know, you might say, well, Hamkiss has one school that I need. If you only need one school, it's probably better just to go through their own program and not have to pay the extra fee. But if there's multiple ones, it definitely saves time. GRE and GMAT, uh, we're going to cover that here in a little bit, but you need to take one of them, or both. So, uh, speaking about GRE and GMAT, I took the GRE based on Brian Visser's uh, recommendation. And, uh, you know, it's, it's totally different, because Austin took the GMAT, uh, Todd took the GRE as well, um, but it, it goes. The decision should be based on what school that you're interested in, because some schools require the GMAT or prefer the GMAT, and some schools uh, prefer the GRE. So that goes along with doing your research. Just real quick, how many of you are interested in, in grad school? Like, are, are all of you? In, okay. Have you done any research at all, or is this like your? Hope you've done it. It's okay if you haven't. I mean, I didn't do a whole lot before. Yeah, I mean, this is this will be good for introduction purposes. Um, but going on with the GRE, I uh, like Austin said. I wish I would have studied longer. I think that's everybody's wish. <laughs> I had planned out like a solid month of studying, a couple hours a day, but it turned into two weeks of studying, a couple hours a day, but. I got the score I, I was looking for, and that's all that mattered to me. So, um, th just this slide goes over some differences of the tests, and G GMAT is more um, math-based. I think that's pretty well known. Whereas GRE is kind of a um, not as much math-based, which I was grateful for. Um, yeah, going. Real quick, just a, a quick tangent. If you're, did you guys buy any programs or do any classes? I did. You did? I didn't do any GMAT. I bought an online program from magoosh.com and it was $100. And I strongly recommend that program just because of the layout and the test questions, the study guides that they had. I took like five or six practice tests. And they look exactly like the real thing. So it was really helpful for me to kind of gauge where I would score and see where I can improve. So uh, that's my huge. It's the and I, I did the program that I did is called Newton GMAT. Um, it was it's a, it's not it's not cheap. I think it's three hundred and fifty dollars, um, and you get the program for um, somewhere between like three and six months, and you can go through it um, at your own pace. What's really nice about it is it does legitimately prepare you for what's going to be on the GMAT, um, and you get a lot of practice tests. That's really the biggest thing um, that I really felt with standardized tests was getting, you know, not just trying to learn the methods of the test, but actually just taking practice tests. Right. Um, that made a huge difference being able to just take the practice test. Because the questions are unlike any multiple choice questions that I had ever faced. They were just worded differently, and the answers were different. I don't know about how the GMAT was, but that was the case with the GRE. So 
definitely you've got to spend some quality time studying for either exam. Yeah, for example, with the GMAT, you have, you have what's called data sufficiency questions. Um, there's no other test in the world that has data sufficiency questions. So if you haven't prepped for them, um, they're really, really daunting. They're daunting even when you do prep for them. Um, kind of the idea behind them is you're given um, a question like, is x greater than y? And you don't actually have to solve the problem. You're just given two sets of data, like data A, data B, and you have to answer whether or not can you answer the question with data A alone, data B alone, data and A and B together, neither of them. You know, it's really kind of, it, it gets complicated. So if you haven't prepared for it, you go into that test day and it's, it's very, very daunting. So just make sure, make sure that you're definitely preparing for that. And uh, the English, I wasn't too worried about the math part. Just, I felt like I had sufficient math skills. Maybe that was a little ambitious of me to think. But the English part of the, the test was really tricky for me. Fill in the blanks. Um, and uh, mocap, there was long sections of uh, readings that you had to analyze, and it was really hard. Um, but again, that just goes back to preparation. Um, yeah, the English, the English one on, on just the side of the GMAT. Um, there's more on reading comprehension. Uh, the reading comprehension uh, segments are they're pretty long, you need to get through them pretty fast. Um, that that kind of comes back to the same thing of doing practice tests because if you do practice tests at a time, you're used to getting, you're used to knowing what you have to do in a certain amount of time. Um, because usually I'm, a, I'm, in general, I'm a very fast test taker in classes. Um, you know, usually in Brother Tolman's class, um, usually get through. I usually get through those pretty quick. But on the GMAT, I took all four hours because um, it's it's definitely. Uh, it's a difficult task. So if you know what you have to do in that amount of time, it makes it it makes it really nice when you don't have to guess on your last questions. Yeah, it's there was one section on the GRE where I had like three, two or three minutes left and I had four questions and I had, you know, just had to fly through. I had to guess on the last two. But you really should take practice tests just to gauge how quick they are. So and then the writing, this is the one part I wish I would have done a little bit more research on. I took, they give you, I think, 30 minutes for two um, writing essays, uh, a piece of an hour of writing. And I took on my first essay, they give you an article that you have to read and you have to, they, there's a prompt that you have to follow. And I took like the first 10 minutes of just like analyzing the article. And I wish I would have done that because at the end I was just scrambling to make sure all my grammar was correct and all my sentences worked together. And I ended up getting a lower score than I wanted to on my writing because the length wasn't up to par, I guess. I thought it was really well, well written, but looking at examples of the sixes, this is graded on one to six scale, the sixes were super long and work this way down from there. So that would be my advice if you take the GRE. Just type as much as possible. Did the, the Magoosh program, did they have writing stuff? Yeah, that's the only downfall about the Magoosh program is they didn't have any writing. Um, it wasn't a part of the practice tests. But on GRE's website, they give you all of the prompts that are in the test. So if you went through all of the prompts, you would get one, you'd get both of them on the real test. So that's kind of cool, but there's like 150 in the bank, in the, the pool. So probably not gonna go through all of them, but you can go on their website for free and do that. And see the prompts and see how you would respond and you practice that way. So. so something that, I took the GRE as well. I didn't take the GMAT, but I went to Barnes & Noble and I bought this book, it was $10 and it was the Princeton Review's Guide to Cracking the GRE in One Week. So it's like built for if you have one week to study for the test, how to raise your score. And so I bought that and I read it probably four or five times before I took the test. And the nice thing about the Princeton Review is that they hate ETS, the people that make these tests. And so 
And you can, when you read the book, you kind of get this feeling, this animosity of them being a tax exempt organization and having the monopoly over these exams and whatever. <laughs> so I just felt like I joined sides with these guys that really wanted to help me beat them. But the nice thing that came with the book is it came with practice tests, but it came with a writing section where I actually wrote essays and it went to Princeton Review people who graded them and provided feedback. So I got this feedback from these people who said, you know, this stuff you did in your essay was good. If you want to raise your score, you got to put more stuff like this, or they would tell me that stuff. And so, um, I, and I don't like writing, and I don't consider myself a good writer, but I got a five and a half out of six on the GRE, which put me in the 93rd percentile, and I strongly attribute that to the feedback I got from writing those practice essays. Because I got to see some prompts actually feel the time pressure of writing, and then when I got the results back, um, the actual feedback from people really helped me a lot. So that might be something to consider, especially because it's only 10 bucks. Yeah, so super helpful. It was it was nice. Okay, and then on the GMAT, um, there's kind of two two other. Well, there's one writing part, and it's analyzing arguments. The same thing. It's greater on a one to six scale. Um, and I totally agree with Dexter. The more you write, by you know, just by the statistics of it, the people who write more score better. Um, and that's that's just how it goes. So and then there's another part, integrated reasoning. You have you know a short period of time to read some charts and graphs, and you have to analyze the data and just kind of be able to um, spew back what's going on in those charts. Um, okay, it's enough about standardized testing. So application. So. Everyone's application is going to be different, and that's kind of the annoying thing because even if you use HAPCIS, some programs might require, like VCU required four letters of recommendation rather than three. And two of them had to be academic from a professor. And then other schools would just say, we want three letters, you can pick who you want, you know, it doesn't really matter. As a general rule, a lot of the places would say you wanted one academic. So a teacher, one from your profession, and then one personal, someone who's known you for a long time. But as far as the personal statements go, those are different too. Because I had it in my mind that you know, before school started during the seven week break, I was like, I'm gonna get started because I don't want to be pressured to fill out my applications and dealing with school at the same time. So I, I wrote a personal statement, kind of a general one that I thought I could use for everybody which was not ever the case because everybody had different prompts. So for example, at the University of Washington, I wrote four different essays for the application. And none of them were like include a personal statement. So even though I'd written this personal statement, it was basically garbage. So I did want an essay about why you were involved in healthcare and why you're passionate about it. They want an essay about why you want to go to school at the University of Washington. Then the third essay was a case study where they provided this case for you and you had to write what you would do as an administrator in that situation. And then the fourth one was optional. So I, even though it was optional, I did it because I figured probably maybe nobody else was. But it was like a diversity essay. They want to know why you're different. And so. I definitely encourage you to take time. If there's optional things, um, probably not everyone's going to do it because everyone else is time crunched the same way you are. And I don't, I can't tell you if that had a great personal effect on my application or not. But that is something that I did. That, like some of the other students I know that applied with me, that they didn't fill out. So something to keep in mind, though, you want to show your personality because you're trying to find the right fit. And you also want to show diversity, or why you're different, or why they should they should accept you, because they're you're trying to persuade them that you should be there. So that's something to keep in mind, though, that not everybody's the same. So every school I applied to had different prompts, and I could use chunks of different essays that kind of applied, but just expect to do a lot of writing if you want to apply to a lot of different schools. Uh, yeah, and it just kind of echoing some of the things Tyler said, with, uh, with your personal statement, be prepared to write several drafts. Um, so I don't know about these guys, but I remember the first draft that I had, 
I sent it to uh, Jared Stanger at Penn State to go over, and in a very kind way, kind of said, you just need to start over. Just write something completely different. <laughs> and, and so I had, like, I had a draft that I thought was going to be great, and then he's like, nope, that's not it. And so I started over and kind of had to rehash, and then I did another several drafts of just a second entire essay. And so be prepared, and that's why you need time for your personal statement, because you want to be able to write it, step away from it for a week, and then go back and look at it again. Um, and it will really, really help you. Uh, anyway, okay, so extracurricular activities. This was, this one was, oops, I don't that far. Um, this one was a big, uh, a big selling point for me, because my, my, uh, my GPA isn't super high. My last two years was like a 3.6, 3.7. So it's not really, really high. It's not really low. Um, and then my GMAT scores were nothing to call home about. And so I wasn't banking on my grades and my score. Uh, I really had to figure out what was going to make me shine through all these other people that you know have 3.9s, 4.0s, and scored high percentiles on these different tests. And so for me, a big part was um, my job at the Student Health Center. Um, and it doesn't it just have to be you know, a, a job somewhere. It can be um, getting involved in whatever, you know, being involved in the society, um, volunteering at hospitals, you know, anything that you can do that really is going to benefit um, your career as a healthcare administrator. Because uh, both programs that I, I applied to Penn State and University of Utah, and um, I was accepted into both, and it would, they made it very clear that the reason I was accepted was because of my work experience. Um, because, yeah, like I said, the scores weren't, they weren't phenomenal. Um, and so that played a huge part in, in everything that I did. It had played a part in how I wrote my essays, in how I wrote up my resume, um, and just about everything in my application was trying to really focus on my strengths. And my strength was my work experience. Um, and I had weaknesses in, the, in pretty much all the other areas. So, uh, you know, make sure at the same time that don't do an extracurricular activity just to do it. Because um, admission boards can see straight through that. You know, if you put something on there just to put it on there, they're going to be aware. Especially if they ask you questions about it in your interview and you don't have a whole lot to say about it, um, you know, they're, they're, they'll see right through that. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's what I've got to say about that. Just another quick point about extra, extracurricular activities. Uh, anyone can volunteer up at Madison Memorial. It's, su it's a super easy process. You can basically pick what you want to volunteer in. If you want to do clinical area, they do physical therapy, they do pharmacy, but it's just super helpful to get into one of those areas just to get more exposure, as much exposure as you can. So, all right, letter of recommendation. I really struggled with this going through my application. I had two nailed down, obviously Brother Tolman, and I asked Sister Watkins for one. The third one, I just couldn't think of like something, because I had moved around all through growing up, and I didn't really have like a bishop that I could go home back to that knew me for years and years. And so I ended up uh, finding a bishop that I worked with on campus here while I was married. But make sure, I think this is obvious, but sometimes it's not. Make sure the people that you ask will write a positive letter of recommendation because that's not always the case. Even though you may know them or you think they will, um, I think they'll, they are honest in their letter of recommendation. And most of the time on the application websites through the programs, um, they give you an option to, you can either see, get a copy of the letters of recommendation or you can sign away your right to see them. And a lot of writers won't write a letter for you unless you waive that privilege. So I, I had to waive all the privileges. I don't know about you guys, but so I didn't see any of my letter of recommendation. So make sure the people that you ask, uh, I don't know if you have to bribe them or you know, do whatever you have to, but make sure they write positive reviews because there are some writers that write negative letters of recommendation. Um, like Tyler said, uh, each school requires different amounts. Um, was it UAB that required four? Is that what you said? Uh, VCU. VCU. Uh, Penn State, uh, St. Louis, and Washington State, and I think Weaver State all require three. But they require three from different 
types of people. Like Washington State, I think, is two from academic, and one personal. Penn State was one academic, and so on. So that goes back to doing your research. But make sure you don't pick a family member. I hope that's obvious, because that doesn't really do me any good. It's like uh, if you had your mom write a letter of recommendation <laughs> for you. Um, but yeah, make sure that's what I would just uh, stress: is make sure you get positive reviews for letters. So, the interview process again is going to vary by school, and you may not always know how it's going to be. Um, I only interviewed at one school, and that was the University of Washington. And the way they did it is they had us come out, and that's one thing you need to remember is that anytime you're going to be traveling to these schools, it's going to be on your own dime. So be prepared to invest some money in this process, either you know traveling to places or paying application fees, and the, ex the exams you to take aren't that cheap either. And so, and then of course you got to pay to send out your scores to schools. And when I went to the University of Washington, they kind of gave us the format in advance, and ours was a group interview. So I was kind of nervous for that because it's like, how do you stand out in a group interview without being overbearing towards other people there? And I kind of felt like a a big fish in a really big sea when it came to the University of Washington because everyone there I talked to really looked sharp. I was kind of hoping I'd get there and someone would come with some bed hair or forget to wear a tie and I'd be like, yes, I got that person, you know, that one person. But no, nobody did except one guy. Um, but the, and so I interviewed, I actually interviewed with, there's three of us and the finance professor who's on the admissions board. And they didn't, they just told us that case study that we had to write an essay on that we were gonna have an interview about that case study. And so I kind of didn't know totally what to expect. You know, I read over the case study and trying to know what I needed to or what I thought I needed to. And so that I could answer whatever the person asked, asked me and could answer their questions. And we got in there with him, um, Professor Stillman, and uh, he said, okay, I'm, I'm not gonna say anything. I'm just gonna watch you guys work. And I was like, what? What's he talking about, you know? It, it, so he said, you know, I'm not gonna ask questions. We got 20 minutes, and I want you guys to work as a team to figure out a solution, which I thought was kind of interesting because I almost felt like these people were my enemies, not really my team. <laughs> but all of a sudden, we were on the same team. And so um, it worked out well, but not everybody's like that. That's the University of Washington. Other places, like the University of Utah, um, like they wanted me to come interview and you interview with an MBA student first. Like if you go to Iowa or Minnesota, it might just be you and a board, you know, it might just be you and a panel of people. And they'll ask you questions, kind of more like a standard interview where they want to know what your strengths are, why you want to go to that school, whatever. So most importantly, it's just important to be prepared and to be yourself because it all goes back to you trying to find the right fit for you. Um, it's like I know what Brian said that when he finished his interview at, at Minnesota he said whether they accepted him or not he knew he wasn't going there because he just it just didn't feel right when he came out of that interview so just something to pay attention to one other real quick Tyler I feel like going into the interview process most of the kids feel like they have to make a super good impression and they have to not beg for admittance but you know put on that good face. But looking back, I wish I would have gone with him with the attitude of, yeah, I'm hoping to put on my best self for them, for admittance, but I want to interview them too to find out if it's the best fit. Because, I mean, they should want, they want you to come as well if you're a stalwart candidate. They want great candidates in their program. So you have some, a little bit of a pull there, um, and I don't think a lot of students realize that. But if if you have a chance in your interview to ask questions, you can ask whatever you want. If you 
want to find out about finances or you know whatever you can grill them too that's what I'm trying to say so yeah just that along with that my favorite question to ask I ask almost everybody that I interviewed with even you know um, just when I was researching schools not necessarily when I was in the actual interview I would always ask the question you know why why did you decide to be part of this program um, as either a faculty or staff or as a student and so I'd always ask people that question. I thought it was very revealing their own personal reasons um, why they would want to do that. So then after the interview process, basically you'd have to sit on your tail and wait until they make a decision. And it depends on when you apply, obviously. Like James Packer, um, maybe you guys know him. He applied super early, like had all of his stuff in in October and he was able to get interviewed interviewed by Penn State in like December uh, way earlier than most candidates got interviewed and so he found out sooner that way but I found out I interviewed in in the second weekend second week in January with Penn State and I didn't find out until I think mid-February is when I got an email so it was about a month that I had to wait for Penn State and Washington State was later than that, and St. Louis was around the same time. So um, it's just a way to gain. Don't be afraid to call. Um, that's another thing I wish I would have done more is had a better relationship with the secretary of the programs. Call, call them. Ask for um, alumni that you can talk to to get more in, uh, insight into their program. And don't be afraid to be outgoing because that really makes an impression on the program. Is this, uh, this is Brian's yeah, experience? Is Brian's. Okay, so it looked like he wrote his experience down, just remember them. Um, That's something that I did, you know, with each program, because I went and visited both programs after uh, being accepted. We're gonna go ahead and excuse Tyler. Yeah, I got class, so. Well, these guys can take care of you. <laughs> Thanks, Tyler. Yeah. Thanks. Um, for me, uh, you know, I, I would kind of try to gauge what my feelings were after the interview, but I really tried to gauge my feelings after visiting each campus, because I did Skype interviews for both, um, but I wanted to visit each campus before making a decision. And I had to, I had to think deeply about, you know, how I felt in each situation, um, how I felt on their campus, how I interacted with their staff and their students, um, and really, really try to remember that. At the same time, you know what Dexter was talking about just reminds me of something. Don't, because you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna apply, apply to these programs, and your classmates and friends are gonna be applying for the same programs, um, and so you're almost you feel like you're competing with yeah. each other a little bit, and uh, it's like it was kind of funny. I just met Dexter yesterday, and he told me he was applying. He had applied and got accepted to Penn State, and I was like, oh, you were one of the guys I was competing. With. <laughs> and uh, and so don't get discouraged by what happens with other people's experiences. Because, for instance, James, James is a really good example. Um, he was accepted to UW and Penn State. UW is a very highly ranked, they're a very reputable school, um, and he got accepted, you know, pretty, pretty quick, early in the process, they wanted him. Um, and then when he applied for Utah, which is where I'm going, which is much, much lower on the rankings, um, he didn't get accepted to the university. And and, it, and him and I talked about that for a long time because James and I are very very close, and we wondered like why why on earth was that I get accepted to UW but I can't get into U of U, um, and it has so much to do with just what the university is looking for as a fit, you know not necessarily just what's on paper you know what your scores are even what your work experience is it's not all about that um, the rhyme and reason to how universities do stuff still makes no sense to me. Um, <laughs> For instance, you know, Dexter said he interviewed in the second week of uh, January, and then you found out a month later. Yeah. So when I interviewed with Penn State, um, I turned my application in like January, somewhere, I think right around January 5th. I didn't hear back from them until the end of February, just to get an interview. And then I had an interview like the next week on a Friday, and then they told, then they sent me an email Monday morning saying that I was accepted. So <laughs> it's really weird. 
you know, so everybody's, everybody's time frame is different even when you apply at the same time. It's, uh, it's really weird. Really quick about Tyler and James. Tyler was super mad at the University of Washington because James had received communication with them about an interview and Tyler had it. And so in class one semester last when they were applying, Tyler was like, I'm not going to UW. They didn't, they didn't call me, you know, kind of thing. Where actually he ended up getting accepted and had a, a sweet financial package offered to him. So I totally agree with that. Don't let the communications dip, that differ from student to student affect you. Because, like Austin said, it really depends on the university and the student. So, so yeah, that was pretty much the end of our uh, presentation. Do you guys have any questions? Any at all? Justin? I just talked to a friend who said that he had narrowed it down. He started with like 12 and he narrowed it down to like four. Is that pretty consistent with what you did or? I don't know about you, but I had, my, uh, my sites were set on Penn State, like from the beginning. So I had, I wanted to go to Penn State, and then I applied to like two or three backup schools, like Weber State and Washington State. I thought I could virtually like guarantee myself admittance. So that wasn't my experience, just because I was so focused on Penn State, but I would assume. That yeah, for me, I probably started somewhere around 10 schools. I. Um, you know, Lance Udy has that program that we, most of us, I imagine, have probably seen where it goes to like the top 25 schools or top 20 schools or whatever it is. And, uh, and so I kind of just went from there. I looked at um, another list to look at, not just looking at Newsweek's, because um, that's Newsweek's top 20 or top 25 or whatever it is. Uh, rankings can be misleading. Um, and Dr. Clark actually talked to James and I about how, how those are. Um, calculated, it's based on what other programs think of that particular program. That's how it's ranked. Um, and, and, each, and each ranking does a different algorithm. You know, some of them will go off, you know, what's the percentage of job offers, how many of them get fellowships, what's the average salary, starting salary. The algorithm for each ranking is very, very different. So don't go completely off rankings. Like for me, I got into Penn State, and arguably their academics are like in the top 10, if not like yeah. the top five. Um, but then University of Utah was a better fit for me. And it was hard to say no to Penn State because I wanted to go there really bad. But I knew that University of Utah was where I was supposed to be. And it can get, um, it gets confusing. But anyway, I did start with like 10 or 12 schools. I got it down to five. And the reason a lot of us pick five is because on the GRE and the GMAT, you can send your score, what's included in the fee for the test, if you're prepared and you know what schools you want to send it to. Um, either at the beginning or the end of the test, I can't remember. The end. The end. You pick which schools you want to send your scores to, and then it doesn't cost you any additional fees, and they'll send them to those schools. And they, they limit you to five. And after that, it's like 30 or $40 a school to send your scores to. Um, so that's why a lot of us picked five, was because that's what you can send your scores to for free. Um, even though I had it narrowed down to five, in the end, like when I was finally submitting my applications, I only submitted to the University of Utah and Penn State, because in the end, those are the only two I care about going to. Um, and you really have to, you have to nail down what you really want, because in interviews, they're gonna ask you, there's, there's two questions that, I, that you have to be able to like, spew out really fast with any of these universities. Why do you want to be a healthcare administrator, and why do you want to be in their school? Those are like, I don't know if you had that. Yeah. I had, it was so confusing for me because I changed my major to healthcare administration because I had no idea what I was gonna do with my life. I thought I was gonna join the Air Force and become a physical therapist, and then that didn't happen. And, and so I was trying to figure out what I was gonna do with my life. I prayed about it a lot. Uh, Brother Tolman gave the devotional in the very end, it was the very last devotional, fall semester 2010. And so I went and talked to him and asked him, like, this is a good idea, he told me to do 285. So I changed my major, became a healthcare administration major, and the stupor of thought went away. All my prayers were answered. And so when I had all these essays saying, why do you want to be a healthcare administration major? Or why do you want to be in healthcare administration? I thought, how on earth do I get across to an admissions board that the stupor of thought went away? <laughs> That's why I want to be a healthcare administrator. And so I really had to figure out, why do I want to be a healthcare administrator? And for me, it took me about a month to figure it out. I was like, I know this is where I'm supposed to be, but why? 
And it came down to me really wanting to be a part of something bigger than myself, being part of a hospital, and um, knowing that outcomes in healthcare are patients, they're people, they're not just uh, profit margins, they're not just about, um, you know, uh, return on investment for our investors, it's about patients, you know. Obviously you have to stay profitable, but it's about patients, and that's what made me want to be in healthcare. And I can't go to med school because blood makes me faint. So, that was, that's why I wanted to do administration. Um, and then the other thing was knowing programs really, really well. And I'll let Dexter talk about as far as uh, communicating with programs and knowing why you want to be part of the Yeah, so, you, does anyone know Greg Angus? I don't know Greg. He's at Penn State right now. But uh, he was super, super good about communicating with programs. Like, he applied at UAB, and he, like I said in the, in, uh, earlier, he called the secretary, asked for alumni's information, followed up with the alumni, had a good conversation with him. The alumni reported back to the program, and they just thought the world of it. The secretary said, we never had someone follow through like that. So, just again, communicate with the programs, and don't, don't feel like you're uh, intruding or being annoying at all, because like I said, they want you to, not just the other way around, and you can act like that. So, are there any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. So it seems like each school has different requirements for you know letters of recommendation and like your personal statement of like certain prompts. If you use like the same SOPAs or Hamcast, like can you pick and choose which essays you send to each school or? In Hamcast and SOPAs, I remember in Hamcast like you can you'll know if I remember correctly. Because I started Hamkiss, but because I didn't want to, I wasn't going to send resumes, I'm uh, sorry, I wasn't going to send applications to either UW or Minnesota, it didn't matter. Because Penn State and University of Utah don't use Hamkiss or SOPAs. But when I did start that, kind of what it is, is you understand what the requirements are from each school, and then you write all these essays, and you upload them to Hamkiss, and then when you're submitting your application, it'll say, okay, you need to submit an essay for this, this, and this, and then you just like, more or less like a drag and drop of the essays that you have uploaded. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. I, I was kind of the same line. I wanted to write one personal statement and, you know, like edit out Penn State and put in Washington State or, you know, St. Louis. That's just not the case because they give you a prompt and it's different. You have to write on it. So, kind of a bummer. But. Do the schools that you looked at, I've seen on some grad schools they require at least two years of work experience or they'll make exceptions for like uh, volunteer work or exceptional um, um, like grades or whatnot. Right. What were your experiences with with your schools? Were they really heavy on experience or did they say, you know, we can teach you and get you the experience? Austin, I think, got into his program because of his experience. But I, I, I mean, I worked at uh, Home Care Pulse here in town. And it's a home care call. We do interviews with home care agencies and employees. And I think that helped me. Um, it wasn't brought up in any interviews or anything, but I think the whole application process is weighted differently by each school. Like some weight grades higher than others. Some weight personal statements higher than others in experience. Um, but as far as like making sure I had two years experience, I try to like count my mission, but I mean, trying to convey what a mission is to someone who's not LDS was hard, especially over Skype. But um, I think that went into it, my home care pulse, and I volunteered at the hospital. And I just crossed my fingers and hoped that was enough. But um, yeah, I don't know. You yeah, see, that? and for me, I always, um, what I always recommend to people, you know, if you'll see the requirements, and then you say, oh, well, I don't meet this requirement, so I shouldn't apply. Yeah. This requirement, apply, apply yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, 80 bucks, even that's like the highest application fee that I saw, um, drop in the bucket if you get in, in to the university, especially if you get any kind of financial aid. So don't be discouraged from applying to as many places as you want, even if you don't feel like, for instance, financial accounting, <laughs> I'm going to take financial accounting again in my MBA this fall, and I'm ready it, because I got to see it. And, and so, in their application, they say you have to have a B or higher in financial accounting. No one even brought it up. Like, I was like, okay, I'm just going to submit my transcripts and hopefully they like them. 
Yeah. And no one said anything about it. And I was like, okay, cool, I can dig. And so, you know, whether you have, that was the other thing with the University of Utah, because since I was competing with other MBAs, most of these guys were coming in with like post undergrad, full time, two years of work. I have, if you count up all my full time work experience in healthcare, it comes out to like four months. And the rest of it's been part time. And they really only cared about full time, at least on the application. And then when I got in, they were like, yeah, we love your experience. And I was like, well, your application didn't make you think you did. So, <laughs> um, it just, it totally depends. So whether or not you're discouraged about what you think their requirements are, I would highly encourage you to apply anyway. I'm just curious, to what, what schools are you guys interested in? Anywhere in South. Anywhere in the South. <laughs> so you're specifically South. Trinity. Oh, really? But yeah. grad schools like, Trinity's I awesome. I was future for me. I almost applied to Trinity. Yeah, I did too. I have a few relatives who graduated from Trinity, so it's a great school. Trinity. Are you from Texas? Yeah. Okay. Dallas. <laughs> Perfect fit. Yeah. Any? What are you guys interested? What schools are you guys interested? In? Um, Carolina. North Carolina. Mm -hmm. Any particular reason why, or just uh, it's. My wife likes it that it's warm and not as cold as all the other American schools. I, I, can, uh, I can relate to that. The wife part is definitely a part to consider. <laughs> some, some spouses don't like to go across the country. So you know, it was, it was, it was kind of the uh, opposite case for me because I'm single. And so when I went to Penn State, I was all concerned. It was really funny because there's a handful of LDS people in the program, in the Penn State program, and the rest are crazy people. Um, <laughs> but when I went out there, like these guys had even talked before I got in, because um, everyone married out there. I'd have been the only single LDS guy out there. I mean, I just did what felt right and what the Spirit told me to do in my process. Uh, but I'm imagining part of it has to do with the fact that there was like 10 single active LDS women in State College, and there's a lot more in Salt Lake, so <laughs> that might have a part to do with it, yeah. Is anyone interested in like Minnesota, or like the big time programs? Mm -hmm. Just FYI, I hope you get into Minnesota if you apply to Minnesota. They haven't accepted someone from BYU-Idaho since Lance UD, and that was like three and a half years ago. I don't know what's going on there. But. Part of it is less of us have applied. I mean, some have still definitely applied, but I mean, I didn't apply because I kind of wanted to go to Minnesota. But what schools know. are you guys interested in? Um, University of Iowa, Texas A&M, cool. Phoenix Online. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, wear, wear those too. red socks. <laughs> Any, anywhere, I guess tradition. I should change my answer. Anywhere that will accept me. <laughs> See, that that's was my. Where, that's where I'm interested. That was totally my attitude. But like I said, looking back, I wish I would have been like, yeah, you want me too. Like, you want what I have, even though that sounds like <laughs> it. But it's true. They want good students and they want people who will be professional. So you can have that kind of attitude. So are, are there certain like, graduate schools that BYU Idaho has a really good connection with that they're like, oh, we love your students? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Penn State. Penn State, Washington State, St. Louis. I know Brother Tolman, he almost signed, uh, maybe he has already. I heard Jeff Durfee's out there. Huh? Yeah. St. Louis. St. Louis almost signed, like, where they would do three years undergrad at BYU Idaho and then two years at St. Louis and graduate with your bachelor's and master's degree. I'm not sure if that still works, but President Brother Tolman read me an email from the program director at St. Louis and he just ran and raving about us, and but man, I didn't know we were that good. I don't think we're that good, but perceptions, everything, I guess. But yeah, those three schools in particular, and I think University of Utah is more becoming more because Brother Tolman has a relationship with In and Out Healthcare and Scott Parker. So yeah, and just to buoy you guys up about um, you know trying to apply for universities. There are a very small percentage of your competitors are undergrads in healthcare administration. Most people don't come in with all the industry knowledge that we do. And a lot of admissions people understand that. And so, I mean, that gives you a leg up 
on a ton of people just because of what classes you've taken. Uh, so, yeah, something. Yeah, I've just, in my cohort at Penn State, there's 20 of us and four from BYU Idaho. So, and one of them is an English major. I don't know how that happened. But. So he ended up accepting to go there. Uh -huh. okay. I think his name's Austin, too. I can't remember. I remember we talked about him. Though. But yeah, just because Doc Clark is President Clark's son, I think he really values BYU. There's, the, there's uh, a bit of a connection there. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I think he's finally convinced the admissions board of Penn State that we are good at being students and being professional. The kids out there now have made a really good impression. Any other questions? Comments? Did you guys have contact with people that got into graduate school and told you how it was and how the classes were? Because I haven't talked to anybody. Well, I talked to one person, but. Yeah, I'm, you say you're applying to North Carolina. That was like your top. Yeah. Um, I know, I can't remember her name, Kayla. Oh, Kayla, she worked at the Health Center. Yeah. She, I think she was accepted in North Carolina. I think she's going there. I can't remember if it's, I know it's North Carolina. I can't remember if it's North Carolina at Chapel Hill, or if she's doing like, I think she might be doing the professional MHA program. Rather, regardless if she is or not, it's pretty much the same faculty. Yeah, but anyway, there you can you can get a hold of alumni. It, it should be a problem. And if you'd like Kayla's contact information, I can get that. Yeah. Okay. And at like Penn State, there are kids out there I talked to that kind of walked me through the process and told me what the interview was going to be like. So yeah, I definitely encourage that. Um, and just kind of as a, a final thing that I would just say to you guys, as far as my experience with, like I said, Penn State was where I wanted to go, hands down. I was talking to uh, Dexter because I felt very much the same way that he feels now about Penn State. You know, back if I would have had to make a decision back in November, I would have said Penn State, hands down. I wouldn't even have considered Utah. Um, but I had some different experiences, and and divine intervention was a big part of why I chose University of Utah. In fact, even when I made the decision, I still wanted to go to Penn State. Um, but what felt right was University of Utah. So be aware of what your feelings are, um, and really. Try to, you know, it's important to follow the Spirit because the Lord, the Lord can obviously use you wherever, wherever you are. Uh, but at the same time, there is a chance that the Lord needs you in a particular spot. And I think that's very, very important to, for your own growth, for your family's growth, and for the people that you're going to be serving with and around um, and wherever you go. So uh, make sure that that's a part of your process. Make sure that you, you're making the Lord in prayer and scripture study and everything else part of your process and Thanks for having us. If you have any other questions, you can come up and ask us.